What's up, history buffs? Today we're going to be going over the colonial life 1700 through 1763. So this is right after the Salem witch trials and right before all the tension that is ultimately going to cause the Civil War. So what happens in the meantime here? The first thing here is salutary neglect. And basically England has a lot of laws on the books, but they're not enforcing it. I jokingly call this bad parenting. All right. One of those acts is a series of laws called the Navigation Acts. And basically what it meant was that everything had to go from the colonies to England or be on English ships. And the whole idea here is mercantilism. You send goods over to England and then they come back as finished products and you buy those products. But if you're in the colonies, this doesn't make a lot of sense because you can grow tobacco. Why do you need it in fancy packaging? Okay. Um, penalty for breaking the Navigation Acts were uh, the Admiralty Courts, which were trials away from the colonies, usually in England, and basically the judges got paid by finding you guilty. So this goes hand in hand with mercantilism and triangular trade. So salutary neglect, bad parenting, and England's making money, the colonies are making money, and so there's really no reason to enforce these laws. When they do enforce these laws, it's ultimately going to lead to the American Revolution. Number two, uh, the First Great Awakening is caused by a couple of different factors here. The first one is the Enlightenment. People begin questioning and thinking about everything, question everything. Number two, deism. People believe that there is a God, but he's out there. He's some great clockmaker that made the universe, but leaves it alone. And then it's also call, caused by uh, really, you could say, consumerism. Uh, these colonies founded to build a city upon a hill on, are now becoming kind of materialistic. All right? It leads to a couple of things. One, it's ultimately going to lead to tolerance. It's going to lead to church denominations. Um, it's ultimately going to lead to America's first experience together. So whether you're from the New England colonies or the middle colonies, it's the experience that the colonies have together. And this is going to be an identity shift that takes place. And ultimately, it is going to help enable. It's a precause of the American Revolution. All right, Jonathan Edwards, he gives sinners in the hands of an angry God. You are nothing but a loathsome spider. It's all about emotion, feeling God's presence, not just sitting and listening to a boring sermon about feeling God's presence in your life. And then George Whitfield goes out, and uh, he's one of the greatest speakers in American history. Uh, you know, has these new, uh, new birth of freedom uh, speeches that happen. People are born again to the Christian faith. Then they go back to their churches and help make those churches more tolerable to others. The Zanger trial, basically what happens is it's freedom of, of speech. Um, John Peter Zanger, he's a newspaper publisher in New York. Uh, he writes about the governor in very unflattering terms, gets arrested, and ultimately he's going to uh, be put on trial. And they're trying to get him for a libel, uh, which basically means that he's lying. But what happens is they're like, he's not lying, it's just inconvenient for the governor, but he's telling the truth. And so it sets a precedent for freedom of speech in the colonies. So now the colonies are having a common experience together, and they're having freedom of speech and getting away with it on top of salutary neglect. Woo-wee! They're, uh, they're on their way to an American Revolution. In terms of the Stonewall Rebellion, uh, a slave named Jimmy from Angola, uh, he rallies a bunch of slaves together they're in South Carolina, and they're trying to get to Florida, run by the Spanish, uh, and they're trying to get their freedom here. Ultimately, they are going to be caught, as most slave rebellions tend to end very badly. Uh, and what comes out of this are slave codes. Slaves are not allowed to assemble in, in large numbers. They're not allowed to be literate. They're not allowed uh, to have certain rights, like marriage. Um, the Security Act, all males are supposed to have weapons with them on Sundays, because that's the only day that slaves have off. That's most likely when they're going to rebel. And no drums, meaning that uh, no communication between plantations there. So Stoner Rebellion, first major slave rebellion, gets put down, but it freaks the South out. And oh my gosh, these slaves might rebel. Okay, most slaves just rebelled by breaking tools, working slow, pretending that they're sick. Not a massive rebellion. But two years later, uh, the Negro plot, New York erupts in flames, nobody has a cause for it, and so it gets uh, what they believe that the blame should be cast on is on the slaves. They're rebelling again, they're rebelling again, but crazy, it was probably just a crazy anarchist, let's be real here. So two factors about slaves playing a role. Okay. Let's move over here to the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763. It is the French and their Native American allies versus the English and their Native American allies. Okay, big takeaway message here is the join or die, the Albany Plan of Union for the colonies to unite under one kind of government uh, gets rejected by the colonies because they believed it would give up too much independence. 
which is ironic because if you just wait a little bit longer, uh, 20 years we'll say, you've got yourself a Declaration of Independence, which is virtually the same thing. Okay. Uh, basically, George Washington's John tries to kick the French out of the forts. It goes very badly from the start. Fort Necessity gets lost. Fort Duquesne gets lost. Fort Oswego gets lost. Fort William Henry. Epic disaster for the, for the English. The English are going to come back and win. Uh, the most important of which is going to be they win back Fort Duquesne. They take Quebec. And then ultimately it leads to the big granddaddy of them all. I guess this is not a military history co course. You could spend an entire year on that. Uh, but the Treaty of Paris is important because the winner gets North America. So the French are virtually kicked out, uh, and the English now control parts of Canada and the um, vast majority around, around the uh, Ohio River Valley. Moving over here, so what happens is that the Native Americans are not very happy that the English won the French and Indian War, and so they're afraid that these uh, American settlers are going to keep moving west, so what happens is Pontiac's rebellion. He unites Native American tribes under him, and they start attacking English forts along the Great Lakes. Ultimately, he is going to be killed by uh, uh, General Amherst. Uh, he's going to be put down. Um, and so that's kind of the end of Native American resistance for a while, but it is, of course, going to play a role in the future. And then the Paxton Boys, basically, um, during the French and Indian War, a bunch of what are called the Paxton Boys. They're Scots-Irish settlers in Pennsylvania. They've been taking land from Native Americans, and, but they're not getting any help from their government about it. Um, they're being attacked, and the government's not doing anything, and the government is run by the Quakers. Long story short, they massacre some of these Native Americans, and then they're marching on Philadelphia. And so Ben Franklin, who wrote some pretty scathing remarks about the Paxton Boys, goes out there to try to calm down the resistance, tries to calm them down, and ultimately he is successful. Uh, it's not going to be a Bacon's Rebellion where the city erupts in flames. He kind of calms things down, says, look, we'll give you representatives in, the, in, in our little government here. We'll let you voice your opinion. We'll let you write things in the article, give your version of the story. And ultimately, peace, peace is settled. Okay, New York and South Carolina regulators, real quick here. In North Carolina, uh, these farmers aren't doing very well because tobacco prices are falling. They're uh, getting put into debtor's prison, and so ultimately they... Uh, kind of hold up the governments there and they start releasing people from prison. It's basically a Shays Rebellion before Shays Rebellion. Um, uh, so more to come on that definitely later on. Um, in South Carolina though, so you've got uh, these uh, settlers that are being attacked by Native Americans. They go to their government for help. Same old story down here with the Paxton Boys and Bacon's Rebellion. And ultimately the government is going to agree to give them protection. Why you might ask? Well in this case they give them protection because they are trying to stop slave rebellions from happening. Remember, this is South Carolina. If these regulators start having battles and confrontations with the government, who's to stop the slaves from rebelling in the meantime? And the militia goes to put down these guys, who's watching the slaves to keep them in order. Okay, So that is kind of a brief overview here of what's happening. You've got economic policy that's being neglected, a common experience, freedom of speech, freaking out about slavery, which is going to play a role later. England wins North America, Native American resistance is going against the English, and then you've got these issues with Native Americans on the frontier and government representation all playing a role uh, in 1763, which is the prelude to the American Revolution. So have a good day, may the force be with you, and uh, you know, join or die, study or die, really is how it should be. Uh, have a good day, see you later.